All right, welcome everyone to our first astrophysics seminar of the semester. Um, today, we're very happy to have our very own Carolyn Rathel, who uh, recently earned a PhD at the University of Arizona in last summer, and now is a, a postdoc here with us at IES and also jointly appointed um, at PCTS and the Princeton Gravity Initiative. Uh, so today we'll hear about constraining the neutron star equation of state with gravitational wave events. Please take it away. Okay, thanks Susan. Um, and thank you all for calling in today. Uh, like Susan said, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about uh, some of the, my work on getting neutron star equation of state constraints from merger events. And this is gonna be a combination of some of the work that I did during my thesis, as well as some uh, of the ongoing projects that I am currently working on here now. Okay, so to start with by way of motivation, because I know we have a, a broad audience here today, I always kind of like to start by reminding everyone of the wide range of areas within our field in which neutron stars play a role, um, and by extension in which the neutron star equation of state can pop up in. So today, obviously, I'm going to be talking a lot about gravitational wave events, but the neutron star equation of state also, of course, uh, determines in part the outcomes of quark collapse supernovae. It can also influence the gamma ray bursts that are uh, powered by the merger of neutron stars. Um, and these mergers we also now know are the production sites of some of the heaviest elements in our universe via the R process nucleosynthesis. And yet it remains the case that the neutron star equation of state um, is still somewhat poorly constrained in the uh, densities and uh, compositions of interest for these phenomena. Um, so to sort of orient ourselves and understand what has been done and what is currently possible, I think it's helpful to look at, uh, this is really just a, a high density cross section of a cartoon phase diagram where I'm plotting temperature as a function of the neutron excess. Equivalently for my x-axis, I could have also shown you the baryon chemical potential. Um, but uh, in this phase space, uh, we can now start to identify the different ways that different communities are trying to tackle this problem. So there are a number of laboratory-based uh, experiments attempting to solve this problem of the properties and interaction of ultra dense matter. Uh, these are consist of studies of individual finite temperature nuclei, as well as uh, the higher energy nuclear experiments, such as at the relativistic heavy ion collider at Lake Hydrogen, um, which of course is at much hotter temperatures. But these nuclear experiments are somewhat limited in that they only probe matter currently at densities up to or around the nuclear saturation density. In contrast, the matter in the cores of neutron stars can be uh, six to eight times the nuclear saturation density, so, so nearly a full order of magnitude denser matter. Um, the matter in the cores of neutron stars is also expected to be much colder than would be probed by these heavy ion collisions. Um, and as this diagram makes clear, these laboratory-based experiments are also probing matter um, that is uh, essentially isospin symmetric, meaning that it has fairly equal numbers of protons and neutrons. And there are some experiments that are probing uh, slightly more asymmetric matter, uh, but they're still all pretty far to the left side of this diagram. Um, whereas neutron stars, of course, contain very, very neutron-rich matter. So going from these experimental constraints to the uh, conditions we expect to find in neutron stars requires extrapolations over density, in some cases temperature, and also the composition. And all of these introduce some uncertainty, and this is part of why the equation of state for neutron stars is uh, an unsolved problem. And so really moving forward, you know, constraining the neutron star equation of state uh, really requires um, observations of neutron stars to influence the theory in this region in the parameter space. And so today I'm going to talk about what we can learn um, with this newest window that has opened into it. Um, and so briefly the outline of my talk, in the first half or so of my talk, I'm going to discuss what we've learned so far from the mergers that LIGO has already seen. Um, specifically, I'm going to focus on constraints on the tidal deformability and what this means for the radius and the equation, of, uh, and accordingly the underlying equation of state. Um, and then in the second half of my talk, I'm going to switch gears to discuss what we might be able to learn from future events. And in particular, I want to discuss what additional equation of state constraints um, might be possible to derive by looking at late stage observables, by which I mean observations of the system following the actual merger. 
And I'm going to try to make the case that interpreting these late stage observables requires robust numerical simulations, including finite temperature effects, because the actual merger uh, introduces a lot of heating to the system. So these late stage observables, I'll show, as I'll show you, probe a different region of the parameter space than the, than the early heat spiral. But I'll get to those details as we go. Um, but to start with, uh, I thought I'd kind of give a, a quick reminder of where we stand in terms of how many mergers have been detected to date. Um, last fall, I remember Matthias, I believe it was, gave a, a science coffee discussion of LIGO's latest O3A catalog. And with that publication, um, LIGO has now detected nearly 50 merger events, but only a very small fraction of these contain a neutron star. And the primary criteria on which LIGO determines if something's a neutron star merger or a black hole merger is based on the masses of the components. So if the mass is below somewhere between two and three solar masses, it's likely a neutron star. And if it's above that threshold, we consider it a black hole. Um, but that criteria, of course, uh, can fool you a little bit. There are ways to get around it. Um, and so the, the most conclusive evidence of if something contains a neutron star is if there's a tidal signature in the waveform. I'll discuss what that looks like in a few slides. Um, and we can also look for an EM counterpart, um, which is expected to be observed uh, for a lot of neutron star merger cases. Oops. OK, so the first event, which you're probably quite familiar with by now, uh, is event GW170817, which of course checks all three of these boxes. Um, the masses are very clearly neutron star, consistent with neutron star masses. There was a strong detection of tidal effects in the in spiral waveform. And of course, there was the brilliant EM counterpart with a gamma ray burst and uh, associated kilonova with this event. Um, so this is pretty conclusively a binary neutron star merger. Earlier last year, LIGO uh, published uh, a second, what is probably a likely neutron star merger as well. Um, this system has a somewhat larger total mass than 170817. Uh, but it is uh, the component masses are still fully consistent with what we expect to be neutron stars, assuming they formed through standard cellular evolutionary processes. But there was no significant detection of tidal effects in the waveform and no confirmed EM counterpart to this event. So it remains possible that these were two very lightweight black holes, maybe primordial black holes. Um, the gravitational wave signature can't tell us the difference conclusively. Somewhat uh, even more uncertainly uh, is event 1908-14, which was a much higher mass ratio event with a 23 solar mass black hole and some 2.6 solar mass compact object. This object is, is particularly perplexing because this is right in the range where it's very uncertain whether this is a neutron star or a black hole. There are theoretical equations of state that could support an object of 2.6 solar masses being a neutron star. Um, but there's also some observational evidence now actually from 1717 that the maximum mass uh, maybe isn't quite so high, indicating that this would be a black hole. So this gets a big question mark. Again, no tidal effects or EM counterpart that helps us differentiate these two scenarios. Um, but uh, Elias has worked some on this problem. So if you're, if you're interested in this event, you should ask. Alan, him. what's the approximate error bar on the 2.6? Oh, that's an excellent question. I don't remember off the top of my head. I want to say about point one, but uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I can check for you. Um, and then finally, just briefly, uh, in the O3A catalog, there was also mention of an additional very low significance event um, that could be consistent with a slightly more equal mass ratio in neutron star black hole binary, um, but quite low significance. So they also equally well could be noise. And this is the sum total of neutrons star mergers that have been detected so far. Um, and so today, I'm really just going to focus primarily on 1717 um, because this is the only event still that we have a uh, significant tidal detection from. And that's where the rich equation of state information comes from. Um, OK, so 1717, as you know, was this first event. And for a first event, this was an incredibly lucky event because it was very nearby and very loud, which enabled uh, a uh, pretty strong uh, determination of the different source properties for the system, which are summarized in the table here. I just want to point out a few for the purposes of my talk today. Um, so first, I want to point out the masses of these two systems, of the two objects in the system. So these were two roughly 1.4 solar mass neutron stars. Um, so these are sort of our canonical picture for what a vanilla binary neutron star system would contain. Nothing very remarkable here. What I want to highlight in particular, though, is that the component masses are only very broadly constrained. 
So the parameter that is the most cleanly extracted from this sort of waveform analysis is the chert mass, which I've defined up here if you're not familiar with it. This is just a binary effective mass for the system. Um, and this is a very well-determined parameter. Uh, for 17817, it was measured to within one one thousandth of a solar mass, really re rendering it a quite precise mass measurement. Um, and then, of course, the other exciting parameter here is the measurement of the tidal deformability, uh, which, as I've said, is the first and still only measurement of a tidal deformability of a neutron star that has been made. So the tidal deformability of a neutron star or, or any object just measures the quadrupolar response of that object to the tidal potential of the binary companion. Um, in dimensionless form, the tidal deformability just scales like some overall coefficient k2, which is the tidal love number, times the stellar compactness to the minus fifth power. And the scaling already starts to give you some intuition for what this parameter, how it's going to behave. If you have, say, an equation of state that predicts very compact neutron stars, uh, those neutron stars are going to be very hard to tidally perturb. And so this tidal deformability parameter is going to be very small. In contrast, if your equation of state predicts a lot more pressure at high densities, uh, the neutron star is going to be larger and puffier, and you're going to have a, a smaller compactness and larger values of lambda. So that's kind of some of the intuition for how you get uh, can interpret these numbers. But the picture of a court is, of course, a bit more complicated than that um, due to this factor K2, the, the tidal love number, which as you can see here, additionally depends on the stellar compactness. And it also has some extra equation of state variation um, shown by the different lines here. The black and red lines are, are different theoretical equations of state. So K2 can vary by an additional factor of uh, two to three, depending on the equation of state. And so having uh, this tidal deformation in the system as the neutron stars are spiraling into one another leads to a detectable imprint on the gravitational wave signal, basically allowing for uh, causing an asymmetry in this uh, and the two otherwise point masses as they orbit each other causes uh, the in spiral to accelerate. And the system ends up merging earlier and at slightly lower frequencies than if they remained as unperturbed point particles throughout the in-spiral. And so that's just what's shown in the figure here. The dashed lines are the waveform that you predict for two point particles orbiting each other. Um, and then the solid line is uh, the gravitational wave strain you would expect when you allow for these extended matter effects. Um, it turns out though that the, the the tidal deformabilities of the two individual stars are also very highly correlated parameters, just like the masses are. This is not surprising when you're considering a binary system. Um, so instead, the parameter that is typically measured, it's the most cleanly extracted from the waveform analysis, is a parameter that we call lambda tilde, uh, which is an effective tidal deformability of the binary system, which as you can see here, um, is just a, a somewhat messy mass weighted average of the tidal deformabilities of the two stars. And as we saw in the previous slide, those individual tidal deformabilities depend on the stellar compactness and on the equation of state. So the expectation is that this lambda tilde parameter is going to measure some mass weighted average of the stellar compactnesses modulo the equation of state effects that we saw in that K2 factor. These are the constraints that LIGO actually measured from 170817. Um, to give you a sense of scale, uh, lambda tilde theoretically can range anywhere from values of up to a few thousand, which is what you expect for big puffy neutron stars, down to values of zero, which as Huang Shen has recently told us is the theoretical limit for a black hole. Uh, on this, so, so already I should say 17817 is telling us that the two neutron stars in the system must be relatively compact because this tidal deformability parameter is relatively small. On this uh, plot in the vertical lines are also the predictions of a few different theoretical equations of state. And so by making comparisons to the predictions of different theoretical equations of state, we can also start to rule out certain families of models like these MS models as, as being less likely or less consistent with the data. But when the first set of uh, lambda tilde constraints were coming out, it wasn't obvious that we were going to be able to say anything more concrete than these sort of hand wavy arguments about the compactness of the stars or these very specific comparisons to the predictions of different equations of state. Um, and so I think, in my opinion, one, one of the kind of interesting outcomes of the follow-up analysis to 17017 was the discovery of what turned out to be a new quasi-universal relationship between this binary tidal deformability parameter and the neutron star radius. Um, and this universal relation uh, is only really observed 
once the chart mass becomes very well determined. And it turns out that once you fix the chart mass, basically all of the complicated mass dependence that entered into that uh, expression for this binary tidal deformability parameter effectively cancels out. Uh, and this binary parameter no longer depends on how you divide up the mass between the two component stars in the system. And that's what's shown on the left here, where for a fixed chart mass, I'm varying how I'm dividing up the mass between the two stars in the system. And you see that effectively you always get roughly the same binary tidal deformability parameter. And instead there are these nice clean separations on the neutron star radius. I should point out here that I'm talking about a single neutron star radius. Um, because for a, a large family of equation of state models, um, it is predicted that uh, over a, a pretty wide range of masses that all neutron stars will have a, a, a pretty similar radius. Um, and so even though the neutron stars in the system might have different masses, we're assuming that they have a common radius. Um, that doesn't hold for every equation of state, but this is kind of a, a reasonable assumption for nucleonic models. Um, and we were able to actually derive or, or prove to ourselves the origin of this effect analytically by uh, turning to a, a quasi-Newtonian framework for an n equals one polytrope. I can talk about those assumptions if you're curious later, but this just allows us to treat the problem fully analytically and write down a complete expression for this binary tidal deformability parameter so that we can perform now a series expansion about the mass ratio Q in order to identify the order at which these component masses are actually contributing to this binary parameter. And so the results of that analysis are shown in cartoon format here, where the binary tidal deformability we were able to show it depends on some overall scaling, which depends just on the chart mass, which is known, and the radius, which is what we're after. And then you can see the expansion terms here. So first you'll notice that um, the component masses only enter at second order. And that's partially due just to the symmetry of how this binary parameter was originally defined. Um, but the particularly interesting result here is that the coefficient of that second order correction term is at most only ever 4%. And so to within the 4% level, we were able to, to show and derive an analytic mapping uh, that maps the binary tidal deformability parameter to the neutron star radius to the 4% accuracy level. And so that's what's shown in the slide, um, the figure on the left here, where the different clusters of points are, again, the predictions of different theoretical equations of state. And the purple band going through it is our uh, analytic relationship that we derived. Um, and the width of that purple band corresponds to that 4% uncertainty. So this is effectively now a one-to-one -one mapping between lambda tilde and the neutron star radius. And we can use this to take the constraints that LIGO measured from GW170817 and perform a direct transformation of those posteriors to constraints now on the neutron star radius. And from this sort of analysis, we find that 17.17 tells us that the neutron star radius is between about 10 and 12 kilometers at the 68% confidence interval. Um, and I think this is a, a particularly powerful tool in part because one of the main goals of the neutron star equation of state community for the last decade or so has been to measure the neutron star radius using X-ray observations of neutron stars, primarily in uh, low mass X-ray binaries, either during quiescence or during their so-called bursting phase. And so on this plot, I'm also showing in the dashed gray line a summary analysis of a dozen different LMXB sources for which the neutron star radius has been measured. And so what you're seeing here is that these two fully independent methods for measuring the neutron star radius are pointing towards kind of common values of the neutron star radius being relatively small, perhaps around 11 or so kilometers. Um, I want to point out that uh, there are a number of different groups that have also found evidence of this uh, quasi-universal relationship, either analytically using different assumptions or um, empirically using a wider range of equation of state families. Elias has worked on this problem some as well. Um, and from all of these different analyses, there are a lot of different estimates of the radius that have come out. But I think they're all, uh, you know, they, they vary some in the exact numbers they predict, but they're all in agreement. I think that 17 by 17 is telling us that the neutron star radius is relatively small, which is consistent with what we had been finding from the X-ray community, even though um, there's no reason that these analyses a priori should have agreed with each other, except that, you know, we're kind of converging now on a common answer. Okay. So we can also look, uh, compare these different types of analyses directly in equation of state space as well. So these now are summary sets of constraints from full Bayesian inferences 
Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of how those Bayesian inferences are performed, but if you're curious, uh, I'd be happy to chat a lot more about that process at a later time. Um, but the, the results I'm showing here are uh, summary sets of constraints. So in the blue and the orange are two independent analyses of the X-ray data. So these are again from the LMXB sources. Um, and then the, the orange band, uh, sorry, the green band going right on top of that are the set of constraints that LIGO measured from GW170817. And all of these constraints also take into account some low energy nuclear data, which constrains the low density region of the parameter space, as well as the existence of a two solar mass neutron star, which constrains the high density part of the equation of state space. Um, but you'll see that again, we saw this just before in radius space, but now when we're going directly to equation of state space, again, that, that these, what we've learned from 1708-17 is fully consistent with what the X-ray community had been finding previously. Um, a, a note for the uh, experts in the audience, the LIGO constraints that I'm showing here are constraints that were inferred uh, by directly fitting the spectral EOS parameters directly from the waveform. So these didn't go through the tidal deformability as any intermediate parameters was a direct fit. Um, and finally, I just want to comment that because this is a summary plot, these have slightly different error bars. So take you know the, the extent of the overlap with a bit of a grain of salt. Uh, but I do want to highlight that the constraints that we have from 1708-17 are already starting to be competitive with what we had previously been finding from those uh, a decade of effort constraining those X-ray sources. And 1708-17 was a really lucky first event, as I've said. Uh, but so it's perhaps unlikely that we're going to get another 1708-17 event, uh, like event anytime soon. Um, but if we were to get a, a larger sample of lower significance measurements of the tidal deformability, we could start to build up the statistics on lambda tilde and, and get increasingly stringent constraints here uh, in equation of state space or in radius of space. Um, and so I think this is an exciting time to be considering these equation of state constraints, knowing that LIGO is going to be turning back on again in about another year and a half and, and observing a lot more of these events. OK, so all of these equation of state constraints that I've shown so far have come from the in spiral part of the waveform. Uh, and during that part of the merger, um, the, sorry, got confused with my slides. <laughs> During, during the inspiral part of the merger, the neutron stars are expected to remain thermodynamically cold, by which I mean that the neutron stars, um, that the average energy of the particles is, is less than the local Fermi energy. And so we can safely neglect thermal excitations and treat the matter as if it's at zero temperature. Uh, this is also true for isolated neutron stars or neutron stars in the LMXB sources. So basically all previous astrophysical constraints that we have on the neutron star equation of state are all on the cold equation of state. Uh, however, from the point of merger onwards, when the neutron stars start to come into contact with one another, there's significant shock heating that can raise the temperature of the system up to some tens of MeV, at which point uh, thermal effects can no longer be neglected. Uh, and having more or less thermal pressure is going to play a significant role in the total pressure budget of the neutron star remnant. Uh, and so when we're talking about looking now at late stage observables or observations of the system following the merger, uh, we're probing a fundamentally different region of the parameter space than we were probing with the in-spiral or with any previous astrophysical EOS constraints. So what are the types of late stage observables I'm thinking of? Um, well, on the one hand, we have the EM counterpart, which is determined by, in large part, by this post-merger phase. So one way that the thermal part of the equation of state can influence the EM counterpart is by influencing the lifetime of the merger remnant. So following the merger, there are different possibilities for what can happen to the merger remnant. If the two neutron stars were very massive to begin with, so that their combined total mass uh, far exceeds the, the maximum mass allowed by the equation of state, this object will undergo a prompt collapse and, and form a black hole. In contrast, if the original neutron stars are very lightweight, so that their combined total mass is below that maximum mass threshold, this object can survive indefinitely as just some massive neutron star remnant. But then there's the, the interesting case where the two neutron stars have a combined total mass that is maybe just above that maximum 
maximum mass threshold so that if you have additional sources of pressure support, say through differential rotation or through having more or less thermal pressure by the shock heating of the actual merger, um, the object might be able to survive temporarily before eventually collapsing to a black hole. And so having more or less thermal pressure uh, in the equation of state is going to influence potentially how long this object can survive. And so by extension, how much rotational energy it can impart into the ejecta and how much neutrino or radiation it's going to uh, shine into the ejecta, which is going to, of course, influence the counterpart. Um, this can also influence the, the properties of the matter that is ejected from the system during the merger, the dynamical ejecta, both in terms of how much matter is ejected, as well as potentially the, the composition or velocity distribution of that matter as well. And if the, the remnant object is a massive neutron star that survives for some amount of time before collapsing, um, this is going to be a, an asymmetric, messy object that's rapidly rotating. And as it does so, it's going to emit gravitational waves as it's sort of oscillating and sloshing around um, and relaxing down to some equilibrium state. And those post-merger gravitational waves, which are going to be kind of the, the main focus of the last part of my talk, um, are expected to be a quite sensitive probe of the underlying equation of state. Uh, and we can see this a bit more clearly, but instead of looking at the, the gravitational wave strain in the time domain, but instead looking at the gravitational wave spectrum, where on the left, this is the spectrum specifically of this post-merger phase. There are a few different lines here. I just kind of want to show the general features and focus on the, the main spectral peaks, um, which are here labeled F1, F2, and F3. These spectral peaks uh, are, are generically found across a wide range of different simulations. The labeling and that interpretation of these peaks can differ from different groups. Um, but for example, this F2 peak is generally assumed, uh, which is always kind of the largest peak in the spectrum, is generally assumed to be caused by the quadrupolar oscillations of the merger remnant. And it has been found empirically that the location of these spectral peaks can shift depending on the equation of state that you started these neutron stars with, basically. Um, and the key parameters here are typically the, the stellar compactness or the neutron star radius. So if you have more or less compact stars or, or larger or smaller uh, original stars, it can shift the location of these dominant spectral peaks. And so what a number of groups have found is a, a set of quasi-universal relations between the locations of these peaks and these neutron star parameters. So for example, the F2 peak has been found to correlate quite strongly with the neutron star radius. And this provides a, a potentially powerful tool that if LIGO eventually measures the post-merger spectrum, which it has not yet done, um, by measuring the location of this F2 peak, we can use this kind of mapping to get constraints directly on the neutron star radius and then compare them to all of the other types of constraints that I, I have been talking about so far in my talk today. Can you say again what the interpretation of F1 and F3 is? Uh, so that depends on uh, who you ask. There are different interpretations by different groups. Um, in some interpretations, this is a coupling between a quasi-radial mode and the quadrupolar oscillation. Um, in other interpretations, this is sort of like driven by the double core structure oscillating within the neutron star remnant. Um, uh, yeah. I, that's that one is a matter of debate. The F2 is generally assumed to just be driven by the, the quadrupolar dominant m equals two mode. Well, okay, you know how, oh, sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, do you know how um, like strong we'd have to detect an event to be able to see the ring down or um, like how loud an event it would have to be? Yeah, so uh, with current detectors, it would have to be probably within like the 10 to 30 megaparsec range, so, so quite close. Um, the prospects improve if you go to third generation detectors. Uh, we might be able to observe single events a little bit farther away, or um, there's also some prospects for being able to coherently stack spectrum for, uh, from multiple low significance events and, and make a detection in that way, but that also would probably require third generation uh, signals. So, so if we get lucky with a 17.8.17 like event or it would have to even actually be a bit closer than that. We might be able to detect this. Uh, it also, it de the prospects for detecting it also depend on, on what the equation of state is, um, but yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, what you mean by radius here? Is it the radius of the star during the inspire before merger or during this post merger? Where it's really good question. Uh, when I'm talking about the radius, I'm always talking about the cold non rotating neutron star radius. So kind of the, the TOV radius of the original system. Okay. Uh, so as I have mentioned, though, in this post merger phase, uh, the there is significant thermal pressure. And so we need to be careful with how we are modeling the finite temperature effects in order to accurately predict what these universal relations should be. And there are two main ways that groups typically uh, model the finite temperature equation of state in this post-merger uh, phase. One is kind of the gold standard, and that is to use uh, a realistic finite temperature equation of state table, um, which is a calculation that is performed to get the pressure at arbitrary density, temperature, and proton fraction, and then you can make a big 3D lookup table of these values. The problem is that that calculation uh, is, is very difficult. Um, and so as a result, there just aren't that many of these finite temperature equations of state that are available in the literature. And the models that do exist uh, span a really limited range of the possible parameter space. They're just really coarsely sampling uh, kind of the different physical possibilities. So to get around those limitations, what a lot of groups instead do is they turn to an ad hoc approach in which the total pressure uh, is modeled as the sum of some cold pressure, which can be anything, even something as simple as piecewise polytropes, totally agnostic. And then a thermal correction is added on after the fact. The problem is that the thermal correction in this conventional approach, which is also called the hybrid approach, for those in the room who are familiar with this, is based on an ideal fluid uh, description of the matter in which uh, at low densities, the thermal pressure is just dominated by the relativistic C of leptons and photons. And at higher densities, it just rises like an ideal fluid. So thermal pressure just goes like NKT. But of course, the ideal fluid approximation is a very poor approximation for neutron star matter, which is highly degenerate. And so if you take into account the effects of degeneracy when doing a calculation of the thermal pressure, what you find is that as you move to higher densities, Basically, what happens is that um, as degeneracy starts to set in, some of the available free energy of the system goes into the interactions between particles. And so you end up seeing this characteristic dip in the thermal pressure at higher densities um, as degeneracy sets in. Uh, and so for realistic equations of state, the thermal pressure can overestimate, uh, the thermal pressure in the hybrid approach can overestimate a more realistic calculation by three to four orders of magnitude at densities and temperatures of interest. Um, okay, so I mostly said this on the previous slide. So just one comment, uh, a few more comments on the hybrid approach. Um, when I say it's based on an ideal fluid treatment of the matter, what I really mean is that they're assuming an adiabatic relation between the thermal pressure and energy with a constant uh, thermal index gamma. And this does have its advantages. This is a very flexible approach, and it's very computationally efficient to implement compared to those uh, giant 3D lookup tables. Um, and this is exact in certain regimes, uh, but it's a poor approximation, as I've said, for neutron star matter, um, for which realistic calculations of gamma thermal find that there should be strongly density dependent uh, in, in kind of core regions for neutron stars. And it's been known for some time now that the uh, using this hybrid approximation compared to a more realistic finite temperature equation of state can introduce some errors into the uh, post-merger observables that we've been discussing. Um, so these are comparisons where uh, neutron star merger simulation is run using the same cold equation of state, and in one case, adding on the hybrid approximation, in the other case, using the, the realistic calculated thermal approximation, uh, thermal calculation. Um, and so in this paper by Andreas Baswein in 2010, they showed that using this hybrid approximation can affect the location of that peak post-merger gravitational wave frequency. It can affect the lifetime of the merger remnant by factors of two, and it can also affect how much matter is ejected as well as the post-collapse uh, accretion disk mass significantly. Um, but there hasn't really been an alternative. And so this hybrid approach remains in pretty widespread use in modern merger simulations. And so this was um, part of the motivation for uh, 
one of the uh, components of my thesis, which ended up uh, being the development of a new framework for calculating the equation of state at arbitrary temperatures and uh, compositions. And the goal of this model is to maintain the flexibility and the computational efficiency of this hybrid approach, where we want to be able to add this to any kind of cold equation of state that you can write down. Um, but we now want to improve the thermal treatment uh, to include leading order effects of degeneracy. Um, the other uh, key advancement of this model that I, I, I don't have time to talk about today, um, but I'll just mention briefly, is that this model also allows the proton fraction to vary um, uh, in during the merger. Um, the hybrid approach necessarily forces the matter to remain in the uh, having the same composition as its initial cold beta equilibrium composition. So the proton fraction cannot vary in a hybrid evolution. Um, but here it can um, through uh, an additional correction term that we introduce based on a parameterization of the nuclear symmetry energy. So if you're interested in that, we can maybe chat more later. But uh, I'm going to just focus today on the thermal correction that we developed. And so this thermal correction is based on uh, uh, a Fermi liquid theory based calculation. Uh, we're just taking Fermi liquid theory results basically at leading order in which the, the thermal energy just depends on the level density parameter um, and, and the temperature. Uh, and so level density parameters just shown down here. This is just the ratio of the relativistic energy to the Fermi momentum. Um, if you are curious in the full analytic derivation, uh, it's done really nicely at nice leading order in this paper from 2015. Um, but Without getting into a lot of the details here, the key takeaway is that the degenerate thermal energy and pressure can be written down just as functions of the density, temperature, and this parameter m star, which is the particle effective mass of the system. And so if you knew a priori what all of your degrees of freedom were and all of the interactions between the different particles in your system, and you could write down a full Lagrangian for those interactions, you could calculate what this effective mass function is exactly and get this complete correction term. But we don't want to require that much knowledge a priori in order to keep this model very flexible. And so uh, to that end, we instead introduced a, a new approximation of this effective mass function, m star, uh, which is a very simple approximation that just takes advantage of the asymptotic behavior of the effective mass function, whereby at low densities, the effective mass just asymptotes to the, the rest mass density, uh, uh, the rest mass of a baryon in vacuum. And at higher densities, again, as the degeneracy starts to kick in and some of the uh, free energy of the system goes into the interactions between particles, there's a characteristic decay of the particle effective mass, um, which we characterize just with a simple power loss slope. So this is a two parameter model where the parameters are the density at which that decay starts and the power law slope of that decay which can uh, approximately be related to the density at which particle interactions start to become important um, and basically the strength of those particle interactions. And so the figure on the right is just now showing the performance of this uh, framework for calculating the thermal pressure. So in this figure, the diamonds are the uh, results of one of those realistic calculations of the thermal pressure at three different temperatures. The dashed line is the hybrid approximation, which you can see really overestimates the thermal pressure at, at these high densities, which are neutron star core densities. And then the solid line is our new model for the thermal pressure, um, which takes into account these leading order degeneracy effects with this two parameter model. And so you can see we get, uh, are able to much more closely recreate the thermal pressure in this high density regime. Um, okay, so that's all I'll say about the actual model. Um, for the remainder of my talk now, I'm going to talk about some of the, the work I'm doing now, starting to explore the parameter space of this MSTAR model uh, with merger simulations. So these are now running uh, neutron star merger simulations, binary neutron star merger simulations, uh, and 3 plus 1 numerical relativity, where we have implemented this MSTAR framework to uh, evolve the, the finite temperature part of the equation of state self-consistently uh, at late times in the merger. Whoops. Uh, okay, um, so the parameter study I'm going to discuss today is just a, a preliminary parameter study. Uh, we're considering five different evolutions 
each of which starts from identical initial data with two cold neutron stars that have the same cold equation of state. Um, and so the only difference between the five evolutions I'm going to show you uh, are in the thermal part correction that we added onto the cold equation of state. So we evolved three different sets of M star parameters that sort of bracket the parameter space of um, of the, the model that I've shown you. Uh, and for comparison, we also evolved two constant gamma thermal uh, constant gamma thermal approximations, um, which are sort of bracket the range of values that are typically used in the literature in those hybrid uh, approximations. And so the, the effective thermal index for these three sets of MSR parameters are shown in the figure on the right here. And you can see that uh, these are strongly density dependent functions. And so the question is how much does this density dependence influence the, the outcomes of these merger simulations we're gonna run? So I'll go ahead and play a simulation, uh, some videos from the simulation. I, I don't know how well it will work over Zoom, so I have some snapshots in the next few slides as well. On the left, you're gonna see the evolution of the density of the two neutron stars. And on the right, um, this is gonna show the thermal pressure relative to the cold pressure. So blue indicates that the stars are dominated by the cold pressure, so thermodynamically cold, and, and red indicates that the thermal pressure is dominating over cold. So you'll see as the neutron stars approach each other, they become tidally deformed. And it's not until uh, they start to actually merge that you see significant heating in the thermal pressure side of this. Uh, and as the system evolves, you're seeing these kind of quadrupolar oscillations of the remnant. Uh, the very core of the neutron star remains cold, but you, we have significant heating up to up to quite high densities, which I'll show uh, better in, in the next few slides as well. I'll replay just the first few frames so you can see the evolution of that heating right at that interface between the, the neutron stars as well. So does this case never make a black hole at all? Uh, it did not collapse or show any signs of collapse by the end of our simulations. We ran 25 milliseconds post-merger. Um, Okay, so if I can go to the next slide, yes. Uh, these are just snapshots now. Top panel is density, middle panel, thermal pressure versus cold, and the bottom is temperature. So if you're curious at what temperatures are actually being achieved in these simulations, focus there. Um, but I wanna draw your attention in particular to the middle panel first. Um, this is for one set of M star parameters, and I'll toggle between this slide and the next slide, which is for a different set of M star parameters. Oops. And you can see that we are seeing uh, quite different thermal profiles for these neutron stars following the merger. Oops, sorry, this is harder to do than I expected. Um, we can see this a bit more clearly also by looking at uh, averages of the thermal pressure profile. So this is these are density average. Uh, this is the density averaged thermal pressure extracted along the x-axis just shortly after the merger. Um, and and what we're seeing is that at densities of up to around three times the nuclear saturation density, so pretty deep into the neutron star, core densities here are five times the saturation density, uh, the thermal pressure is contributing a few tens of percent of the cold pressure. So this is really uh, a significant contribution to the overall pressure budget, budget of the neutron star remnant. Additionally, I want to draw your attention here to the fact that between the different thermal treatments that we're evolving, we're seeing factors of a few difference in the thermal pressure at, at a given density within, neutron, within the neutron star. So it seems that uh, the, the actual pressure profile within the stars is, is actually quite sensitive to uh, the choice of the M star parameters that, that we adopt. And so this all, um, can be seen a bit more clearly now by looking at the actual observable signatures. So these are the gravitational wave strains that we extract from these different simulations. So on the left are uh, the gravitational waves from the MSTAR evolutions and on the right are from the hybrid evolutions. Uh, if I, I have separated them just for visual clarity, if I were to plot these on top of one another, you'd see that the in spiral portion of the waveform for all the different thermal treatments is identical. There's no difference uh, during the in spiral portion, which is what we expect uh, from what I've told you that during the inspiral, the, the stars remain cold. But you can see there are quite significant differences in the post-merger phase of the, the waveform, both in terms of the amplitude of the gravitational wave signal that is observed, as well as in the sort of beat frequencies of, of these kinds of modulations in the post-merger waveform. 
Um, and, and that can be explored a bit more closely by, by looking in turn at the post-merger gravitational wave spectrum, which is what I've shown here. And again, just to separate them for visual clarity. So in these post-merger gravitational waves, um, I've, I've tried to identify uh, the different spectral peaks, similarly to what I showed you before. Um, I just want to focus primarily on this dominant peak, F2, which, as I said before, is driven by these quadrupolar oscillations of the remnant. And so what we observe is that um, between the different M star approximations, the location of this F2 peak can differ by about 200 hertz. If we compare instead the the range of uh, F2 values for the gamma thermal uh, uh, approximation, constant gamma thermal approximation, it varies by a bit more, by about 400 hertz. Um, but and to give you a sense of scale, uh, from those quasi-universal relations, the value of this F2 parameter has been previously found to range by values of about 2,000 hertz uh, for radii that differ between 11 and 14 kilometers. So these are second order effects that I'm discussing here for, for what the thermal effect, how the thermal effects influence uh, the location of this peak. But there are two main takeaway points here that I, I want to highlight. The first is that while this is a second order effect, the fact remains that the, the finite temperature part of the equation of state remains uncertain. Uh, and, and these uncertainties in, these thermal, in the thermal physics here may ultimately limit how precisely we can measure the radius using this kind of experiment of, of measuring F2 in, in these quasi-universal relations. So if we were to construct an experiment in which we tried to extract the radius from the location of these F2 peaks using those quasi-universal relations, we'd find that the radius is between 11 and a half and 12.2 kilometers. Um, but in this experiment, we set the radius to begin with identically for all neutron stars. And we know that the, the radius in these simulations was 12 kilometers to begin with. So this suggests roughly half kilometer errors. Um, that The value of that error will likely depend on, on the binary parameters in the equation of state. Um, but fun, fundamentally, there, there may, we may eventually run into some floor to how well the, the radius can be measured using this kind of experiment until we are able to better constrain the finite temperature part of the equation of state. So that's the pessimistic takeaway. Uh, the more optimistic takeaway is that the fact that these post-merger spectra depend on the M star parameters um, gives us actually a, a new way of potentially probing some interesting nuclear physics. And so for what example, one interesting takeaway here is looking at the choice of M star parameters, it seems that the parameter N0 is, is what determines the location of this F2 peak. Um, and remember, this density parameter is related to the density at which degeneracy sets in for nuclear matter, whereas the, the strength of the particle interactions seem to be less important. When we vary this by, by a large range, we don't see any difference in the location of the F2 peak, which is already uh, an interesting result. Um, this is a small number of simulations, so this will need to be confirmed uh, with more M star parameters and a wider range of binary systems. Um, but you can imagine that in principle, if someday we had perfect knowledge of the neutron star radius, uh, measurements of the, these post-merger gravitational wave spectra could in principle allow us to measure uh, these M star parameters, the, these nuclear parameters that are inaccessible through uh, observations of cold neutron stars. OK, so with that, I'll just wrap up with a few quick summary comments. Um, I, I think this is an exciting time for equation of state constraints using gravitational wave events. As LIGO turns back on and gets continued to be upgraded over the coming years, um, New observations of the tidal deformability are only going to help strengthen the constraints that I showed you, both on the radius and the equation of state. Um, and, and these constraints are only going to continue to improve. Um, and looking forward, I think there uh, is a wealth of new information that we can add to this picture by starting to consider these late stage observables. Um, but this requires uh, really digging into these kind of subtle effects uh, in uh, the numerical simulations uh, this M star framework that I've discussed today allows one way of more robustly treating the thermal physics and merger simulations. Um, and we're already starting to see that the details of that treatment 
uh, do influence the post-merger gravitational wave spectrum that is observed. Um, and finally, I'll just comment uh, that the gravitational wave learning seminar tomorrow, uh, I'll also be leading a discussion more pedagogical on neutron star mergers that will have next to no overlap with what I talked about today. So if you're interested, uh, please join us there. And with that, I'll, I'll take any questions if there are some. Fantastic. Yeah, let's open for questions. And let me also say that we will hold a group discussion with Carolyn at 3 p.m. today at the same Zoom link as we're on now. So feel free to join for that. But, all right, questions. Sure. Feel free to maybe I can, jump in and raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe I can I can go ahead. Um, very nice talk. I have one thing just, just occurred to me. This is about um, the validity of the model at high densities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the merger of 1.4 with 1.4 solar mass stars, right? So what is the density that you probe in this? So the maximum central density of mm -hmm. the remnant is uh, five times saturation density. Okay, so that that's pretty high. I mean, what, what I was wondering is, you know, the higher you go, the more degrees of freedom you're missing out on. But if you were to do this for let's say 1.2, 1.2 or so, where you reach lower densities, you might still be in a region where the model is always valid. Right? Yes, at, at high densities also though, the, the thermal pressure becomes less important, the matter is colder. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, you're, you're right. Uh, one thing Elliot is alluding to is, uh, that I, I did not mention is the fact that this framework assumes only nucleonic degrees of freedom. So this is valid for and new, neutron, proton, and electron matter. Um, it could be extended to include hybronic degrees of freedom, say, but th that's not currently included in this model. Um, and so at higher densities, those degrees of freedom may, may change this picture some. What effects do you expect in neutron star black hole mergers? I mean, the thermal effects, would they uh, show up uh, similarly in these ring down uh, waveforms that you were showing for the neutron star, neutron star ones? Well, so the ring down waveform uh, only probes the equation of state if the remnant survives as a neutron star. So in that case, you, you don't have a neutron star remnant. Um, but I mean, you, you you probably will still have some disk of material orbiting around. I mean, what would the how, how would that be affected by the thermal effects? Yeah. So so the the disk could still be affected by the thermal effects. One thing I, I didn't discuss today for these simulations, which are neutron star neutron star merger, we do see some variation in how much matter is ejected. Um, and these previous studies also suggest that that the disk mass is going to be affected if there's a disk that's formed. Um, these are really good questions. Um, a lot of this deter will be determined by the mass ratio of the system. Uh, if you have very large mass ratio, the neutron star kind of just plunges into the black hole versus if they're more equal mass ratio, you can have more uh, of a tidal disruption. But um, maybe I can I can jump sure. in. Do you want to so the, main, the main difference is when you when you look at the plots that Carolyn was showing, like all of the temperature is produced at the collision. So if you have no collision, if you just have tidal disruption, you remain pretty cold. So usually in simulations of neutron star black hole merger, you get like five MeV or so. Um, the, the, the thermal effects are not, well, they are important, but but not not as much as they're here. This is because uh, fluid motion is mainly shearing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you, you just you just basically squeeze the thing, but there's no shock heating taking place, right. so you don't get the temperature up. Okay, good point. Thanks. One additional comment to that is that uh, the differences between hybrid and more realistic treatment are more significant at, at mm -hmm. lower temperatures. Um, but overall, the thermal pressure is also going to be lower at lower temperatures, so that it, it's unclear which of these effects will will dominate. Alan, what's in in your simulation? What what's the final mass? And given your given your cold equation of state, do you expect this to to be an eternally living neutron star, or once it cools off, is it going to collapse? Yeah, so the, the final mass of this object is uh, about 2.7 solar masses, which is above the maximum mass for the cold neutron star, cold non-rotating neutron star. So we think this object is supported partially by some differential rotation, pr primarily by differential rotation, and additionally a little bit probably by the, the thermal support as well. Um, but is that the gravitational mass or the, the baryonic mass? That's the gravitational mass. mass. Okay. The eight. Um, but uh, on, on the time scales that we were able to evolve for, it, it, it seems quite stable. It'll be a long time before it collapses. And the difference between 2.8 and 
seven is stuff that's radiated away in gravitational waves or mass that's actually lost from the system or a difference in the yeah, so 2.8 is the initial ADM mass and 2.74 is the final. So about 2% is radiated in gravitational waves. Okay. Um, you mentioned something about like the remnant lifetime. Is there um, like for different parameters in your M-star um, model, I guess, have you looked into um, the dependence on, on those parameters of whether it forms like a differentially supported neutron star or whether it, like um, is like long lived neutron star? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. No, this is this is work that I am planning on continuing with over the next few years that I'm here, um, and that's one of the the questions I, I'm planning to look into is is if we can identify uh, a trend in how long the remnant can be supported um, based on these M star parameters. But we haven't looked into that yet, and and uh, to my knowledge, no one else has either. I, I may have asked this to you before, maybe it was lies, but so really nice constraining the equation of state, but there's a lot of other uncertainties in these sorts of calculations from modeling neutron star interiors to magnetic fields to um, just the simulations themselves as to whether they're converged and whether the, so is there a, sort of a, a way to think about it or a way to, to sort of marginalize over all the uncertainties? What, what are the most important physics or things to work on? I mean, is there other, do you suspect there may be other things that are of similar effect here that are equally important to address or um, and how does one decide what the most important issues are? Um, uh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> there are obviously a lot of effects here that we are not including. These are unmagnetized neutron stars. We don't include neutrinos in these simulations. Right. Neutrinos is um, an obvious one that you might think might be important for some. Yeah, of the that that would be one that I think would probably maybe matter more naively um, without having looked into it very much. Right. Uh, but uh, these are right, of course, important effects. This neglecting those for right now allows us to isolate in and, and right. focus on on you know trying to address how much uncertainty is there within this one parameter, right. but compared to different these right. other sources too. Um, and of course, that makes perfect sense. And you know, these are state of the art, and you know, already incredibly complicated. And improving the thermodynamics is a big step forward. But I'm just sort of almost jumping ahead too much. But you know, just thinking about well, what for those doing these kind of modeling, what should they be focusing on? Should they be focusing on neutrino physics? Should they be worrying, you know, about numerics? It's just I don't know if you have any thought about thoughts about that or certain certain area for the future. I guess. Yeah, I mean. I you know, I, I think one in particularly interesting area is starting to think about the neutrino physics better uh, and adding in some, you know, right. some neutrino transport, but that adds a lot of computational. Yeah, also very complicated. But, but uh, there, there are groups that are working on this now and, and probably have uh, some initial concerns. I, I'm not super familiar with, with what levels of uncertain differences they find compared right. to the levels here. I mean, one, one thing in that, in, that, in that area of the neutrinos that, that actually is not included yet, but that people have speculated is neutrino bulk viscosity. Which could have a similar effect to, um, to the to the thermal shift. So basically, when when the two stars compress, they might not go as far out as they as they went in, simply because you put energy in 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 in, in thermal energy, um, and and that is something. But but it's really really uncertain because like all the rates that that nuclear physicists tell you basically say this is not important. But then you know we, we don't know yet. There's also possibilities for bulk viscosity from additional degrees of freedom, like hyperonic bulk viscosity. People are starting to calculate how much that would influence. Um, again, yeah, it's a, as you point out. Although they, they have recently updated their calculation and now claim this only works at 500 keV or something. So oh, is that right? maybe, okay. maybe, maybe not in the merger. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks. All right, thanks so much. And we are at the top of the hour, so maybe we should save additional discussion for 3 p.m. And let's virtually thank Carolyn again. Thank you all.